All right, so I'm here with Kathleen Karen of Justice in Motion, and correct me if I am saying anything wrong about what you do, but you are finding justice for immigrants across all borders. Um, good, I got that first part, yes. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to sit with you. Um, since it has not been in the news lately, can you tell me a little bit about what is going on at the U.S.-Mexican border with the detention centers and families? Sure. So the zero tolerance policy is officially over, but the administration continues to separate families. So what we're seeing is that they are kind of overemphasizing reasons to say that a child is unfit, a parent is unfit to be with the child and removing them. So the ACLU has been leading the charge. There's a specifically um, part of the bigger family separation package is the current separations as well, trying to understand what is the reasoning behind the government and then challenging some of those current separations. Whew. So what does this actually look like for a child and parent to separate? Uh, it's hugely traumatizing. So when the height of zero tolerance started um, under Jeff Sessions announced it, the then Attorney General, in April 2018 was when the, the height of it happened. And um, the idea was to criminally prosecute parent, anyone crossing the border illegally in a criminal prosecution that is justification to remove a child away. So that's what, where the parent-child separations were happening. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the ACLU moved for an injunction. And when dust, the dust settled, we realized that 2,400 parents had been separated from their children. This is just parents. We're not talking about extended family. This is just the parents that were separated. So that was the initial Miss L lawsuit. So um, I'm a lawyer, not a psychologist, but the stories that you hear are, are, are terrible when the ch children are ripped away from their parents and have no idea when they're going to see them again, if they're going to see them again. Can you tell me a, like a story example of what you've heard or seen down there, maybe one instance that I know there's legal parts where you have to hold confidentiality, mm -hmm. but can you paint a picture of the details of, because I think there's a discrepancy of how rough it is. Right. So one case story that we worked on was um, a father from Guatemala who brought his six-year-old daughter up with him, fleeing extreme violence and poverty. And when he was at the border, um, you know, they put him in difficult conditions with his daughter. And so for two days, they were in freezing what they call like ice boxes, which are just over air conditioning cells. And imagine crossing the desert and then being put in, you know, highly, <laughs> highly cold, um, cold rooms, which the migrants call hileras, like ice boxes is the common term for it. So the little girl was exhausted and constantly sleeping in his arms. And then the father started noticing through the glass through the windows that they were separating parents and he was just having this dread that this was going to happen to him as well. So when the official arrived, um, he separated, he physically separated them and the little girl tried to run toward the father and he slammed, the official slammed the daughter, the six-year-old girl against a wall because she was physically trying to run to be with the father. And then, so she fell on the floor, was screaming and screaming and crying. The father was just saying, I don't understand. She's my daughter. Why are you taking my daughter? What do you do with my daughter? And they just... They just shackled him and took him out of there. And his last shackled vision of his daughter, well, yeah, sure. Wow. And his last vision of his daughter was her screaming on the floor saying, you know, don't take my daddy away. And so for the next weeks, he had no communication with her. And then the official started working on him. This was like one of the subset of the separated parents is that there was deceit in getting them to agree to go back to the country of origin, thinking that they'd get their children back. So it's just kind of one of the examples. And so he finally signed the papers. He didn't speak to his daughter for several weeks. He had no idea where she was. They just kept saying, oh, she's in a children's shelter. But you know, if you sign these papers, you'll be able to get her back. And so he didn't want to sign the papers, but he finally did. And then there was a group um, that were brought to the airport, and they were told that she was going to be at the airport. He was told that. Mm -hmm. And when he showed up, there he was with some other fathers, too, and the return, and the children weren't there. And then the official said that was just lies to get you to leave. And then he doesn't even remember kind of boarding the plane and leaving. So he's like, I'm leaving my daughter behind. Oh. And they told me she'd be back. So those are one of the cases mm -hmm. that we ended up being uh, finding in the country of origin and talking mm -hmm. to the family and then being involved in the re specifically in the reunification. Mm -hmm. The little girl went to foster care for several months in the U.S. in the United States okay. and then was finally sent back to her death. Oh, for how long was she there? I think it was several months before she was returned. And then when she was so traumatized, she didn't even recognize her mother at first when she arrived back home. Oh, so and the psychological impacts on these children and parents are, are long-lasting. Oh, 
Now I know you're the lawyer and I'm the therapist, but can right. you tell me some of the symptoms that you might have seen? Uh -huh. Not sleeping very well, being very angry at the parents, feeling very uh, betrayed, not understanding why they were left. Especially the younger they are, the more they definitely didn't grasp what, what the purpose was. They feel some sort of, like, why did you leave me behind? You know, mm -hmm. some of the cases we're hearing, the kids hate the parents. Like, they're saying, I hate you. It's like this crowd, I love you, I hate you, just total confusion of why they were left behind. You could abandon me. Completely abandoned me. Mm -hmm. oh. And there, I mean, you know, the parent wasn't in a position to understand kind of the geopolitical decision around mm -hmm. what was happening, mm -hmm. let alone describe that to a four year old in the moment to explain, you know, I'm not abandoning you. Like, I have no control over this situation. Kids can't understand that. And the parents didn't know what was going on. Oh, I imagine there's language issues. And, mm -hmm. um, and sorry to rewind a little bit, but when you say icebox, how cold are you talking? I actually don't know. Okay. We just hear, you know, we just hear the migrants talking about how, how cold it is. So I just yeah. think it's a, you know, seriously over air conditioned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Texas yeah. holding cells. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, and I imagine there's physical, physical things going on as well. Can you speak to that? For the children? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard about like bedwetting and, mm -hmm. you know, not doing well in school, not wanting to interact, like so mm -hmm. having a lot of problems with relationships, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of crying, a lot of depression. I mean, there was one suicidal teenager um, as well that was returned. And then accessing psychological services in the countries of origin mm -hmm. have, has been difficult because there's just a lot less. Like we work in um, Mexico and Central America, and most of the separated families have come from Guatemala. Huh. Um, so there are some psychosocial support services down there and our, how we're structured is we work with a, a network of human rights defenders and human rights organizations and individual attorneys that are spread out all through Mexico, all the way down, you know, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're trying to locate local services for these families, the ones that they're encountering as part of our piece of the, of the work to help with the family, to reunify the families. Wow, this is a lot. You guys are, this is a lot going on. Still, yes. even. <laughs> yeah. And um, knowing that I know you do much more beyond just the border that's happening, mm -hmm. can you speak to more ways that you support immigrants? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. what we do at Justice in Motion is protecting migrant rights across borders. Mm -hmm. So we ensure that if a migrant is in the United States and faces labor exploitation and then returns by force or choice to the country of origin, that they can still go after you know, the, an exploitative employer even though they're not physically in the United States. Okay, can you tell me a story of what that would look like? Where, what kind of job would they have? Would this be an au pair, a farmer? What, what, what? All the above. Okay. You know, one just quick example that comes to the top of my mind is um, the non-immigrant work visas, like guest worker visas or temporary mm -hmm. foreign work visas. They're all the same. Mm -hmm. Some people, um, there are some low salary, low skilled visas that are H2A for agriculture, H2B for non-agriculture. So people come up for less than one year. So there's one big case with H2B forestry workers. They're planting pine trees in Southeast, um, Southeast United States. And when they came up, they were grossly underpaid. So the, the, the employer needs to promise, has to pay a certain wage mm -hmm. to be, get the permission to go look for workers abroad. And so they had, you know, whether they had no intention, I don't know, but they definitely did not pay what they had promised the government to pay. So I think their average wages were in the 200s. Mm -hmm. So what happened is when the visa expires, people go home because that's the rules of the program. So mm -hmm. we got a call, I think it was from North Carolina Legal Services, to help find more of the potential aggrieved workers back in Guatemala. So it was a big effort to go find several tens of workers to build the case, bring get more evidence, and then having our defender team up to kind of translate a complicated foreign legal system so that workers that are no longer in the U.S. still feel kind of empowered um, mm -hmm. to do something about their rights, even though they're not here. So that's wow. just one example of the labor rights that we, it was kind of why I founded the organization. Mm -hmm. I'm a farm worker lawyer by trade. I was for many years, and that's kind of the origin and came of it because it was very difficult to represent clients in court when they're no longer here. Um, huh. So why would somebody who's viewing this care why, you know, okay, well, they're no longer, they're not a U.S. citizen, they're taking, you know, the idea is they're taking jobs, mm -hmm. why, why, they're gone, mm -hmm. why should we care about somebody who's at another border and we have enough issues, that's what I hear from other people, what, what's your response to that? Right. Broadly speaking, it's about upholding standards for everybody. Right? When you start exempting certain people from protections, it's mm -hmm. it's going to be a snowball effect. So if you look in 
the uh, labor rights context, for example, if you're allowed to bring people in and pay them a dollar an hour, like why would you ever hire a U.S. citizen yes. <laughs> if you can get away with paying someone hardly anything and they don't have any access to justice? So it's really not a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's about being fair to all people um, when they're physically present in the United States. And if you carve out the people that leave, you're just encouraging this exploitation, which has an effect, a rippling effect upon U.S. citizens that are based in the United States. <sighs> It's, that makes a lot of sense. It all comes around. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, and I imagine there's there in a, international law that pl takes, I mean, feel like at the border, there's like, where is, part of me goes, where is the UN? Right. Um, but I imagine there's international law about this, or is it, are you working mostly with, see, this is so out of my realm, law. <laughs> this is mostly <laughs> natural. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Psychology and law. Yes. <laughs> and I'm way out of my realm right now. <laughs> well, we're mostly <laughs> using domestic law, okay. so international law does does play a, a good role and kind of it kind of underscores and supports the domestic system. So when domestic systems get really out of line, international law is useful because you can say, you know, the rest of the world, like this is the global standard, how the rest of the world is doing and what we've agreed to in different kind of conventions and treaties. So it's kind of a, a marker. Mm -hmm. And also, you can also leverage it to have different con international conventions have different um, kind of rapporteurs or experts related to them and they can do country sites and country visits and do reports and just having that global feeling part of the rest of the planet is important so we can feel we can learn from other countries and other countries are really upset about family separations it's interesting it's not just the u.s citizens which is fantastic people in the u.s mm -hmm. are really are, are loud and generous and demanding that it ends and making a big difference but the people in other countries really care about it too it's pretty mm -hmm. you know you really do see that the u.s effect the world and the world cares about what goes on here and they're they're tied to it if things don't go well and in the United States it's gonna it's gonna spill over to their countries as well which we're which we're seeing with you know there's very much a double standard with um, the administration's policies they say they don't want migration mm -hmm. but at the same time they're undermining um, democratic forces in Mexico and Central America which then provokes migration because yes. it's de still destabilizing the region. Yeah, so it's bleeding, it's having dom domino effects, mm -hmm. it's coming back and forth and back and forth. That's right. um, so touching a little bit of trying to push you into the psychology here, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> you can try this. <laughs> Maybe you can answer the legal way, I'll approach with the emotion. Okay. So I, from what I read, mm -hmm. I see the emotional struggles of the immigrant would be being voiceless, mm -hmm. having lots of fear of being deported, fear of being detained, um, yeah, the voiceless part really comes up to me, bullied. Um, what, how does this change some uh, immigrants' life living here? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's about, I think the statistic is 12 million people are here unauthorized. Mm -hmm. You know, that's bigger than many nation states. Right? Many countries are actually smaller than the, the populations. 5% of the U.S. labor workforce are people that are unauthorized, that are, are working. So I think before there, um, there was always the unsettling feeling that people could be deported at any time. It's just ramped up to a scale that adds kind of like a nastiness and a viciousness to it um, that wasn't quite as present before. Hmm. I can understand that. Yeah, um, so people feel like they can be deported at any moment, are very nervous about leaving their children. Like it's, it's just, it's a very tense time yeah. for immigrants. Um, it's, it's, yeah, probably, and my, my guess too is it probably stops us from integrating as a country too. Do you see that or am I, the immigrants, you know, well, I mean, over the course of immigration history, there's been so much exclusion of violence against immigra immigrants at different periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people are just just rightly scared, and yeah. so just kind of staying to themselves and hoping that uh, this will this will pass. I mean, I, I think really ultimately, ultimately, the yeah. answer is legalization. You cannot have 12 million people without status, whereas employers are very happy for the most part to employ them and some cheat them as well. But they really need to then you know advocate for them to get legalization. So people that have these jobs that are already to some degree integrated mm -hmm. in our society, that there's always this unsettling feel, feeling now that people can be deported, but many people have been here 20 years. So they are to some a large degree integrated into the society. So just normalizing that and then kind of coming up with a new fresh immigration policy is what we need to do. I mean, the yeah. status quo is just totally unacceptable. Can you give me some, can you please give me some 
a story that amplifies maybe a bragging little moment? What was a moment that you were really proud of? All right, there's lots of moments, but I do think that um, family separation was a moment for us to really show why this cross-border collaboration works and has a huge impact and make a huge difference on lives. So with the initial people that were separated, uh, 400 were sent to the country of origin, and we, with different partners, found all 400 parents. Amazing. All 400 parents were able to make a decision over the future of their lives, like gain control over their children's future. Mm -hmm. And now we're moving into um, the justice and healing phase of it. So really, the government needs to be accountable for this atrocity. So this also, we are the defenders and where they're located in Central America have established relationships with these families. Um, so they're kind of vetting them and talking about what does justice mean for you? And for some of them, it means you know, a lawsuit against the United States government. So that is all in development now. And then the day that they prevail will be a huge moment of pride for, for me and the team and the defender. Well, for everyone, for humanity, honestly. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So what is it like for you? How has this work shaped you? Um, I think... I think it's it's super empowering to be working cross border and bringing in different voices into the dialogue because it was really seen very unilaterally how we were working on legal cases that were affecting people crossing borders. So making these connection with the defenders, working cross borders, I think it has shaped me to be um, to see bigger and to see a little bit bolder and to to try. I mean, it was hard to start an organization on a whole new theory of portable justice because people didn't necessarily believe me that it would work, right? Like they didn't necessarily want to work with people, with with foreign, with uh, lawyers in other countries. And so mm -hmm. I think um, it, you know, shaped me to, to stick with your beliefs. And if you have a gut sense mm -hmm. that something's going to work, like you just can't give up, um, mm -hmm. and you got to make it work. And, and it has. And I think family separation, family separation has really demonstrated that. Hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and you, know, you have family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How has this affected your family? So uh, my family's all in. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's good. You gotta be. I, uh, I have a husband and a ten-year-old son, um, and they've been with uh, with me with this adventure. I mean, my son Marley was um, you know literally conceived right before our first Defender Network mm -hmm. training when I brought lawyers together from Southern Mexico mm -hmm. and Guatemala to see like, can we do this? Does this Defender Network yeah. concept make sense? Yeah. And so he has kind of grown up with the network, which has been a, a beautiful thing, and been on trips with me. I mean, we brought. When we were expanding um, further south, we started in Guatemala and Mexico, but then I expanded it to Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Mm -hmm. and, sorry, in Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, my family moved with me. So we all went <laughs> down to Nicaragua for years. I thought either I'm going to be constantly traveling yep. to do this work and finding defenders and bringing mm -hmm. them into the network, um, or maybe we'll have this whole new adventure for my family. So Marley was three and a half, and my husband had never lived outside of the country, and so uh, it was a fantastic experience. So they, they love it, and they're super mm -hmm. proud, and they're better ambassadors than I am about the work. I mean, you talk to them, and they're like really good at talking about what justice across borders looks like. Oh, I can't imagine your 10-year-old <laughs> just beaming, like, mommy does. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, so... Forgive me, Shrink Tank, you can edit this out, but if I already asked this question or not, um, what, um, what can people really do to help with the justice for immigrants? Mm -hmm. I think in, in this particular moment, psychologists have a key role. Mm -hmm. um, volunteering or low bonus. Sorry, I'm like, oh boy, this is on me. Well, I'm going to bring you on the yes, test. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I mean, lawyers have a key role, but we all yes, have a key role. We do. So we I do. think yeah. in the sense of the psychological impact and the kind of mm -hmm. the insecurity that 12 million people feel in this country, which is the numbers of people who are living here uh, without authorization, mm -hmm. that has all sorts of effects, right? Mm -hmm. On the medical system, because mm -hmm. people are probably suffering greater illness from stress, et cetera, et cetera. So I think volunteering, finding the local immigrant, mm -hmm. um, immigrant center and just seeing if you can be helpful and have some mm -hmm. office hours, I mean, that might be great. Um, donating on always is a good thing to support organizations that are, are doing good work to kind of fight against this um, this uh, you know this crush of taking mm -hmm. away migrant rights mm -hmm. um, and then politically it's really important that we have the right politicians in the office like in office doing something because ultimately what we need is legalization to be able to stabilize the current immigration immigrant um, immigrant population in the United States. And so that's really kind of the longer term political political solution. Mm -hmm. So we can have helping the therapist help lawyers, voting, 
Mm-hmm. And money still speaks, it still helps. Yeah, it yeah. certainly does. Yeah, and I imagine with a small nonprofit too that makes big impact, that a little bit goes far. Oh, yes, it does. It did, it did, it did. I mean, we couldn't have done the family separation work without yeah. like, the overwhelming generosity of the you know people in the United States that wanted to do something. It was yeah. quite incredible how people responded. Oh, so. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, what is something that you wish people would understand that? maybe they do or some don't that just really is the heart of it. Mm-hmm. I think the idea that we're connected beyond borders, I mean, that, that we have a border that is a literal, is a real border, but it's also a fictitious border in our minds. And I think we, we self-censor ourselves, kind of we let ourselves be confined to our nationalism. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is if we, what was interesting about family separation is people really saw that we are connected across borders. Like the only way we could step up for some of these families was by working in another country and connecting it back to the US system. So I think um, there's a really strong cultural identity for a United States to be kind of independent and we know the right way and not kind of learn lessons from other peoples around the world. And um, I think that's a real barrier in lots of ways for Mm -hmm for bigger change in the world. And if you connect it to climate change and that movement, people, if you just think within your own borders, like the planet won't survive. So I think in that context, it's a little bit easier to understand why we have to work together, but still the challenges are there because nation states are digging in and say, this is my sovereignty, I don't want to give it up. So that, even in that context, which is even more obvious, people still kind of shut down with the border in mind. So I just think, um, transnationalism, portable justice, like we just have to have a different way of thinking and not thinking that the U.S. always knows what's best mm-hmm. and expect people to follow that. Mm-hmm. Yes, we would call that a little touch of narcissism in psychology. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> we, know, we know best. Um, not diagnosing America with it, but we could maybe on some <laughs> realm. But I love that word you use, transnationalism. Uh-huh. Or, that's fantastic. That really sums it up, and that we're we're all together, the whole world, and we all affect each other. I would love to end on that note. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. This is just absolutely talking to uh, fabulous talking to Kathleen Karen of Justice Emotion, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tasha. Yeah.